Let's have a word of prayer before we do that. Lord, thank you for this scripture. Father, I do ask that as we study it, Lord, and we observe the way you did things with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, Lord, we would recognize there's tactics coming against your church, but Lord, I pray that, Lord, the message, the main theme message of this book, this chapter, these verses, would be applied to our heart, not the opinion of this man. Lord, we want to highlight your word, because your word is that which lasts for eternity. My opinion is worthless. So Lord, I pray that you would give us insight. I pray that your spirit would minister to us so that we may walk closely with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in Acts 14. Acts chapter 13 was super long. We had to fly through that. Maybe last week you were like, didn't seem like we were flying. But we were. We get to slow down a little in Acts 14. Paul has established a pattern. Seems that whenever he goes into a community, he has one thing on his mind, and that is that that community needs the gospel, and he's there to bring it. Paul didn't like to go to places that had the gospel. He liked to go to places that didn't have the gospel, and he liked to share it when he got there. He always went to the synagogue first, if there was one, and presented it to the Jews first. And then later we'll see that Paul, after he establishes the gospel in the community, he liked to go back and minister to those churches. You think, well, why didn't Paul preach the gospel again when he came back through? Well, that's because he had disciples. When he made those disciples, they were the ones permeating their culture with the gospel. But Paul was the spearhead. He was the one who came in and brought the gospel in a community because people don't get saved unless they hear the gospel. People don't change. They can't be disciples of Jesus Christ without hearing the gospel first. Paul makes that clear in Romans 10. When he says, how are they going to believe if they've never heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone preaches to them? And how are they going to preach to them unless they're sent to them? So people that don't know the gospel need to hear the gospel. We know that Paul went through that treacherous journey all the way up north, from Perga all the way up to Antioch, but not Antioch like the Antioch he came from. This is a different Antioch. This is Antioch Pisidia. And when he gets there, he's driven out. Eventually, he's just driven out. But the believers that are there are full of joy, and he gets driven out, so he goes uh, east to Iconium. So he kind of went up to Antioch, now he's going to go east to Iconium, south to Lystra, further east to Derb. He's going to make like a Z. So the first place he comes to is to Iconium. He heads east and hits Iconium. And they enter together, chapter 14, verse 1, into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derb, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So Paul knew when it was time to go, right? It was time to go when you got persecuted. Jesus told us in John, uh, I think that was in Matthew 10, that when they persecute you in one city, that's when you go to the next city. Persecution is not a difference of opinion. Persecution means, it's, it's, I think the definition is a systematic harassment and attack upon a person. Harassment and attack. So with the threat of them killing him, he knows it's time to go. Paul allows people to make him the target. And when they're ready to kill him, he flees. Whenever the gospel is preached, you'll notice that there's always a positive reaction to those who will receive the gospel, and there's also a negative reaction to those who don't. 
Jesus said in John 15, 22, that a servant cannot be greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. In fact, you know when you're really sharing the gospel when there's both of those reactions. There's always a negative effect to the gospel. And we see that what they try to do first here is they, it says here that the unbelieving Jews, verse 2, stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. They poisoned their mind. They embittered their mind against the brethren. Now, Iconium was, uh, was obviously largely Gentile. So what these Jews were doing, these unbelieving Jews, they were starting to, to gather up public opinion. They were going to start to get a public opinion against the brethren and what they were saying about Jesus. They would go around and say, oh, yeah, yeah, they say they're Jews. They're not Jews. Look, you know, we Jews. We don't give you pagans trouble. You don't give us trouble. We don't push our beliefs on you. You don't push our beliefs, your beliefs on us. But you see, these Christians are so intolerant. They're saying that we need to change and be like them. They're saying that we're not good enough the way they are. They think they're so great. Now, I don't know if that's what they're saying. I'm just using an example of popular opinion today. That's the popular opinion and philosophy in today's world. You're an open and kind and more, most righteous person in this world if you are tolerant of all beliefs and you believe that everyone's going to make it so long as they're sincere. That's the popular, twisted, poisonous falsehood that poisons people's minds and bitters them to Christians today. So when you share with someone a hope of Jesus Christ, and they say, now wait a minute. Now, do you believe that you have to believe in Jesus to be saved? Like it has to be him? And you say, well, of course. Jesus said that. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And they say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard of you Christians. See, their mind's already been poisoned. It's been sort of embittered by the culture. It says, oh, I don't even have time to talk to people like you. You're so intolerant and closed-minded. Is public opinion enough to silence the gospel? No, it is not. What is Paul's reaction when public opinion starts to turn against the brethren? So they remained a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. They just kept preaching. They didn't try to reason with them. They just kept preaching. When Paul went into a community, he just brought the gospel. And he just brought it over and over and over and over again. Now, there's nothing wrong with reasoning people and making the gospel clear, but it was really just about the gospel. Paul didn't wait to make friends, maybe get into some, you know, some really good position with the leadership in a community. He didn't wait until everyone approved of him and accepted him as a person and then start sharing the gospel. No, he believes something that we should believe. That the gospel is the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed to the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the gospel is powerful enough. And the effect is clear. As they say, the proof is in the pudding. As he's preaching, the Lord is granting signs and wonders to be done to vindicate, to validate his message. So he's preaching the gospel. They're saying, no, 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 this isn't true. And then, bam, heal someone. Whatever the sign of wonder is, we know what those look like. And that was going on in Iconium. So it's enough to where it starts to split the town opinion. Some are for the apostles. Some are for those non-believing Jews. So they got to fight dirty to get them out of there. That's what they eventually have to do, because public opinion is not enough to silence the gospel. Public opinion is not enough to silence us. If we're being silenced by public opinion, if the public opinion of Christianity is that it's intolerant, we continue to preach it boldly. They may call it intolerant. We call it the power of God and salvation. That's what it is. So we continue to preach it. So after that doesn't work, they go ahead and they plot against them. They get the leaders and the rulers to mistreat them. Those of influence. This would do it. We'll squelch this. 
We'll snuff this out. We'll stop this once and for all. After all, there is money to be made in paganism. There's idols to be sold. There's sacrifices to be made. There's control in that religious system. And so they try to squelch it, and so they move on. They head south to Lystra. And something interesting happens at Lystra. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looked intently at him, and seeing that he had the faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet! And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice, saying, And Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garland to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices to the crowd with the crowds. So you might wonder, well, why didn't they stop this right away? Well, it says there that they were speaking Lyconian, which means they didn't know what, there was, what was going on. It's clear here that Barnabas and, and, and uh, Paul obviously don't have the gift of interpretation. These guys are speaking in another language, and they're like, I guess, there were, I guess they liked it. I mean, I don't know. They're all speaking in their language. Everyone's like celebrating and worshiping. This is great. They're having a joyful response to the blessing of God. But they're interpreting it according to their own worldview. That means that someone can experience the goodness of God and turn and worship the wrong God for the good thing that they received. I've... Uh, I was talking to a person this week, and, uh, and Jeff and I were both talking to him, and, and we asked him, why, why, do you, why do you believe what you believe? He didn't believe in the Jesus of the Bible, but we asked him, what convinces you that what you believe is true? And he said, well, there have been many blessings in my life. There have been many good things that have happened to me because of my faith and I can't deny them now. I've had too many good experiences from, from worshiping in this way. And you know, at first, when you first kind of hear that sort of thing, we're like, uh, you're like in your flesh, you want to like say, no, God didn't do that. God didn't bless you. That wasn't God. You probably just, you probably just got better. It was just a good, it's just got good rain. So what do we do when somebody clings to their false faith with the good experiences that they have. Because these guys were experiencing a good thing and immediately worshiping the pagan gods because of it. Well, without the word of God, without the preaching of the word of God, people will continue to worship the God they prefer as a response to the blessings that God gives. So what do we do? It says in verse 14, But when the apostles... Barnabas and Paul heard of it. They tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with good food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. So what Paul does is he rushes out and says, no, no, no. This good thing that you've experienced is not from Zeus and Hermes. That's not what this is. He corrects them and says, no, we're just, we're just humans. We're just men, just like you. We're not gods. Although they could have gotten a lot further in their ministry if we just let that lie carry on a little, right? No. They immediately correct the falsehood. They go in, they say, no, we're not gods. We've come to bring you good news. And the good news is this, that you could turn from these false things, these wrong things, these vain things, vain just means empty, pointless, purposeless, useless. 
and turn to the living God who created heaven and earth, who allowed you to have all these good things, who gave you good things, good rains. They were attributing all those good rains to their, their, their pious worship of these pagan gods, but God was just giving them good rain because he's a good God. You should turn instead to this good God. So we don't have to, we don't have to tell people, oh, that wasn't God that healed you. That wasn't God who gave you a, a really good, prosperous year of finances when you thought all was lost. That, that wasn't God. That was, that was just chance. But if you worship God, then he'll give you all those good things. That's a lie. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And we could say, hey, I think that's great that God healed you. I think that's great that God did those things. But you're worshiping the wrong God. See, the good God who gave you all those things, you're not worshiping him. Turn away from those false things and turn to the living God. Not these false gods. Even with these, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifices to them. Even by saying, we're not gods. They barely kept them from offering sacrifices because people are just hell-bent on worshiping now. They're going to do it. Clinging to those experiences. So things are pretty unstable, as you can see. And the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, which, by the way, there probably weren't any Jews here in Lystra. And the way, reason we know that is he doesn't go to the synagogue. Not only does he not go to the synagogue, but the Jews from the other cities that he was just in had to catch up and then deal with Paul the way they really, really, really wanted to deal with him. They persuaded the crowds, and they stoned Paul and dragged him off out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, don't get these people wrong. Just because they thought Paul was Hermes and that Barnabas was Zeus, don't think they didn't know what a dead body looked like. Okay? They stoned him. And I don't think they threw pebbles. They stoned Paul and they supposed that he was dead. We don't know if Paul was dead or not. It says that they supposed he was dead, which means there was nothing to persuade the crowds otherwise. They thought he was dead. Paul doesn't know if he was dead or not. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, about 14 years later, he gives this story of how he's like, I, you know, whether I was in bodily or I was in a vision, I don't know. But I know I was caught up to the third heaven. I saw things that were too wonderful for me to describe. But I don't know. So in other words, we don't know, and it's not important to know whether he was dead or not. But one thing's for sure, his revival is miraculous. He says, he was, they supposed he was dead, verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city that he was just stoned in, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derb. What was the first thing that Paul saw when he opened his eyes? His disciples. His disciples. Whether these disciples were from Iconium or Lystra, I, I, I want to say I, I like to think that these guys were from Lystra because they would have taken him back to take care of him, to clean him up, to make sure he was okay. It doesn't say he preached when he went back in the city. It just says he went back in the city and the next day he went on to Derb. But the first thing he sees is the disciples. Makes you think that his disciples were more important to him than life on earth. That he would be willing to go back into a city with his disciples, even if it meant he was going to get stoned again. Sometimes we give Paul too much credit. We think, wow, he's so bold. Paul didn't like getting beat up. He didn't. He had to have an angel at some point say, Paul, don't worry. You're going to be fine when you go there. You're not going to get beat up. Paul got beat up a lot. And this is the first major persecution in Paul's life. But he goes with his disciples. He loves his disciples. And he goes on and can, completes and fulfills his ministry. I mean, come on. If you were going to check out a ministry, if you are going to say, okay, I think I've done enough, this would be enough. Like, to get stoned, I think at that point you could have a pulpit ministry for the rest of your life and be pretty comfortable. You know, yeah, well, I was a, I don't know about all you other ministers, but I went to Lister and got stoned for it, drug out of the city. I mean, you, 
Ministry's done at that point. Retire already. But obviously for Paul, it wasn't about that. He knew at the beginning of his ministry that he was going to show, God was going to show, Jesus was going to show Paul how much he should suffer for Christ's name's sake. For anyone to follow Jesus Christ, they have to know the cost. They have to know what exactly they're getting into. And Paul exemplified that. Paul didn't avoid it. Paul didn't avoid suffering and say, well, I'm out of here, Lystra disciples. Uh, people are going to be coming. They're going to probably beat you up, but I got to go. I'm really important. I got to go on to Derb. So it's important that you just stay and suffer, but, you know, keep me safe because, you know, I'm a really important person. No, Paul wasn't ashamed to bear the suffering of Christ. He went on to say so much as that he came to fulfill what was lacking in the suffering of Christ. He embraced it. He didn't enjoy it, but he embraced it. He chose it. When they had preached the gospel, verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city, that's Derb, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And this is what they did at those places. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul's ministry was not done until the church was established with leadership. In every one of those cities. He made disciples. He established leadership and the elders. And he strengthened their souls. He strengthened their souls by saying <laughs> that it's through much tribulation that we must enter the kingdom. Now, if you got the wrong gospel, that doesn't make any sense. If you got the wrong gospel that says that Jesus is here to give you the best life now, then you're not strengthened by hearing that through much tribulation you must enter the kingdom. But if you're given the correct doctrine, if you're given truth, then if anyone would come after Jesus, they must first deny themselves, then take up their cross, then follow Christ, then that first, first thing is very important to us. And it's, that's what we have to call people to. We have to remind them that if you're going to follow Jesus, just so you know, you have to deny yourself. All those dreams and ambitions you have about how great you're going to be and all the, all the talents that you have that you're going to work towards your own glory, yeah, you've got to say goodbye to those things. And you've got to embrace Jesus Christ and you say, Lord Jesus, even if it causes me to suffer the death of the cross, I will follow you. I will suffer for you. And when you're in the suffering as a believer, this is what you have to know. That your suffering is by design. It's not a mistake. God doesn't have you in a situation that he kind of forgot you off to the side. He's like, ooh, sorry, and has to pull you out of that situation. No. Here in that situation, because this world is not a friend to grace, if Jesus established his kingdom by suffering, then those in his kingdom will suffer. Jesus has not established his kingdom physically on earth. He hasn't. And I will say it. If Jesus has physically established his kingdom on earth, this is a sorry kingdom. And I wouldn't be able to say that about Jesus' kingdom. But he has established his kingdom in our heart. Which means that as we follow Christ, as we follow our king, we follow him as he is. We follow him and we suffer with him. Jesus says that from John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. We're not afraid to suffer. We've counted that cost before we became believers, but we have to be reminded of that, don't we? When we're in suffering, we have to be reminded that our suffering is by design, 
It is through suffering that you enter the kingdom. Remember, this is kingdom stuff, the suffering that you're in. So be strengthened. Jesus said, rejoice when you're persecuted, for so they persecuted the prophets. Rejoice under that systematic harassment and attack. Rejoice. Be strengthened. You're in the middle of it. Jesus doesn't promise your best life now. He promises your worst life now for the best life later. That's our hope. We're not trying to avoid hardship, although we're not looking forward to it. I'm not going out and picking fights with people that I know I'm going to lose. But I will faithfully preach the gospel, even against popular opinion, even if it costs me my job. I've lost clients as a barber, guys that don't come to me anymore, guys that I thought I was really breaking through. I thought we really established something. And <laughs> I never see him again. Either people are going to be offended by the word or they're going to be broken by the word. Nonetheless, it's not about our will and our comfort and our future. It's about the propagation of God's word, the gospel. We boldly bring it because he has boldly died on the cross for my sin. He's got to be worth it. If Jesus is worthy, then he is worth it, right? If he's worthy, he'll be worth it. Worth what? The suffering. He's worth the suffering. We weren't worth it, <laughs> but he was worth it. We weren't worth him suffering on the cross. So he didn't suffer on the cross for us. Because that would be divinely stupid. He suffered on the cross to display his own glory and love, his unconditional love, that he would reach down and love the loveless, love the unlovable. And now the unlovable are loved. Now those who had no hope can cry out, Abba, Father, because of what he has done. Because he is our glorious God. He deserves that praise. Verse 23, when they had appointed elders for, for them in each church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom he had believed. They had believed. In other words, these weren't Paul's elders. These were Christ's elders. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. This is how Christ builds his church. We say, isn't Paul doing this? Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul is acting on behalf of Christ. He's not acting on his own accord. He's acting in the way that the Spirit of God, sent by the, Jesus Christ, is telling him to do things. Elder just means older person, right? Same thing we use the elder, word elder for today. Older person. And from... Uh, Titus and 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have these qualifications for elders. They have to probably be old enough, if they don't have children, they have to be old enough to have had children, not old enough to, have, to make children. That's quite young. Old enough to have had children. We have two elders in this church that are single. If you know anybody, <laughs> they're open, open to suggestions. Uh, but... They're single and they don't have any children, but they are qualified to be elders because they express temperament. They don't, they don't have, they're not angry men. They're not drunkards. They're not liars. They have good reputation within the community. If they do have children, that's another level of testing. Their children have to be in submission to them. If a man has children that are non-submissive to him, then he's not qualified to lead the church. If he can't lead his own family, how can he lead the church? So there's qualifications for these men. It says in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 5 that not to lay hands on these men suddenly. So Paul didn't just, uh, you, 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 you. When Jesus picks the apostles, he prayed all night before he did that. God told him who to pick. 
With Paul, he wasn't just randomly picking people. He knew that they had to have a track record of faithfulness. So he had to be with those churches for some time to see who those men of God were. They probably were Jewish men because those men would have already known the word. They would have been walking faithfully with the Lord. All they would have had to know was the principles of the new covenant and how that played out. Oh, and the fact that Gentiles get to be as equal co-heirs with them of grace. That's new. But he committed them to the Lord, and then they knew it was time to go back. When they saw strong churches, they knew it was time to go back. We know in this church, Red Mesa Fellowship is ready to, to start another church, is when this church is strong, it has faithful leaders, and it has a, a, a people who are growing under that leadership, flourishing under that leadership. You can call yourself a good gardener all you're like. My wife and I are not very good gardeners. We try. We kill most things that we try to plant. We're from Wyoming. We're learning. We've got these two jalapeno plants that were, they look promising. We had a tomato plant last year, and the thing grew two tomatoes. The picture had a lot more. I was like, what is the deal? Ours is busted. We're not good farmers, but we're working on it. When it comes to the church, the ministry of the people within the body are a direct consequence of the leadership over that church. If you have a body that's mostly concerned about the color of the carpet and how people are dressing and whatever policy is there, what kind of pizzazzy children's ministry? I can say that because we don't have one. <laughs> Hard to judge us for something we don't have, uh, other than you know watching little babies and keeping them from dying. Uh, we, we know that that is a direct rela relationship to the leadership. But if the leaders are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is equipping the saints, that's you, if you trusted Christ for your salvation, for the work of the ministry, that's what's going to be happening within the body. We kind of cheated when we moved out here. Everybody who came to this church initially was somebody who was in leadership at LVC, and we all came over from Laramie Valley Chapel in Laramie, Wyoming, and we started this church. Quite healthy. It was, we didn't have anybody to disciple. We were already there. But we had to go out and we had to share the gospel. And we continue to do that today. The best way to do that is by example. Paul exemplified his leadership. And so should we. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. The, the, Pisidia and Pamphylia aren't cities. They're more like states. They're like regions. Okay? So they go through one, they come to the other, and in Pamphylia is where uh, Perga and, and um, Italia are. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that had been fulfilled. And that's something. Man, how long was it? Probably a couple years, maybe three, maybe four. Actually, I don't know. There's probably an answer to that. I just don't know it. It was a long time. And they finally come back to Antioch, the place that was obedient to let them go. The best guys in the church get let go or go on ministry. I'm sure there were letters, but once they get back, they had arrived and gathered the church together. They declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And I got to tell you, that was probably a very, very, very fun church meeting. They got to hear the report. Antioch was full of Gentiles that had put their faith in Christ. And for them to hear about how the Gentile world had just drunk in the gospel. How these Gentile cities, now majority Gentile churches, had leadership, were faithfully following the word of God, were meeting together, declaring the word of God together, worshiping together, caring for each other's needs, and reaching their communities. How exciting. That's how the glory of God is spread. That's how God shows that he matters. He uses us to go out and do it. 
And we are in a community that's very sparse on the gospel. And there's public opinion against what we believe. But we haven't been persecuted. No threat of death just yet. So we can continue and stay a long time and boldly preach the word of God. Boldly bring the gospel to the people that we work with. Our family members. The people we go to school with. To show that we are distinct. We are different. Why are we different? Because our God is different. You see that? We're different because our God is different. We'll suffer through because our Jesus suffered through. We'll be like him. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Now next week, Jeff is going to be taking us through Acts 15. Seems like every time things are going great, then we got some sort of weird thing that happens, okay? So there's some administrative issues going on in the church in Acts 15. We're really looking forward to how Jeff brings that to us. I hope you're looking forward to it. Make sure you read ahead. But we need to be encouraged that our suffering is by design. There are times when our, the gospel is received and the church is budding and growing. Everything seems to be going great. There are times when we need to suffer. But we suffer because our Christ our king suffered. Are we willing to suffer? Do we know that? Is he worthy? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning's encouraging word, Lord, through Acts 14. Father, I pray that you would prepare Jeff, Lord, as he uh, prepares this week for, for a sermon to us. Lord, I pray that you give him Clarity, Lord, you give him clarity of your word so that he can present it clearly to us. Lord, we pray for continued spiritual growth in our own lives. Lord, I pray that when we suffer, we would remember quickly that your spirit would remind us by your word that our suffering is by design. Lord, that is through suffering, through tribulation, that we must enter the kingdom. When we signed up to be in the kingdom of God through Christ, that we should follow after the pattern of our Lord and our King. Lord, I pray that we would take it, we take that responsibility with joy. We would tr believe your word. It says that we can rejoice in trial. We can rejoice when people lie about us, say all manner of evil things. We can rejoice. We're not afraid of public opinion. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We'll gladly suffer for you. One day you will establish your kingdom on earth and it will be glorious. Lord, I pray that you would establish, continue to build your kingdom up in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us. Your spirit would strengthen our souls, our determination. When we look upon the week that's coming, as Monday is just around the corner, we don't look at it with dread. We look at it with joy challenge that could be met because we can be filled with the grace of God to complete it. So Lord, I pray that you would focus our spirit upon all that you have for us this week. We rejoice in you. We love you. We pray that you are happy with our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.